This is episode number 14. My guests today are Alistair Cunningham, Sue Davis Mandelo, and Gina Lockwood. Alistair is someone who has had a truly remarkable life. He is recognized internationally as a pioneer and world leader in psycho-oncology. He has two PhDs, one in microbiology and another in psychology. As a stage three colon cancer survivor, scientist, and an individual who's had a calling to self-inquiry most of his life, not in this particular order, Alistair has devoted most of his life to supporting the psychological needs of people affected by cancer. He's the founder of a program entitled The Healing Journey, offered by Wellspring, a charitable organization that provides supportive care programs to help individuals who are living and are affected by cancer. You can find more about Wellspring by going to www.wellspring.ca. The Healing Journey is a program with a comprehensive coverage of practical ways people affected by cancer can adopt to respond to the illness. It explains potential avenues that one can take to self-discovery away from conventional medicine, things like diet, exercise, ways of thinking about the self and others, to spiritual approaches that contextualize life and living. Alistair has many scientific publications. He has written several books, including Can the Mind Heal Cancer? The Healing Journey and Bringing Spirituality into Your Healing Journey. Alistair really normalizes this idea of spirituality. We're actually all on a spiritual journey. And he normalizes that concept of self-inquiry. I think it's quite fascinating. Strongly, strongly recommend his books. A highlight of his research results is that psychosocial interventions diminish distress among cancer patients. No surprise there. And psychological and spiritual self-healing work may lead to increased survival. In early 1993, Alistair Cunningham helped establish the Wellspring Centers for Cancer Patients in Toronto, which branched throughout Canada. The Healing Journey is now one of the programs coordinated by Wellspring. In 2003, Alistair received the Order of Canada in recognition of his contribution to cancer supportive care, and in 2007, he received the Dr. Rogers Prize. Sue Davis Mandelow has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and a Master's in Social Work. She worked in crisis, trauma, and palliative care hospital settings, followed by 26 years of teaching at Hamburg College. Four years ago, her path intersected that of Alistair. Her course focuses on belief, self-reflection, changing our lives to be as rich as possible, and brief and bereavement. Gina Lockwood, my third guest, is a biostatistician who has worked in the cancer field her entire career. She has been involved with the Healing Journey program both professionally and as a participant. In the 1980s, Gina worked with Alistair Cunningham and his team on research studies showing the benefits of this program. Many years later, after two cancer diagnoses and a recurrence, she reconnected with the Healing Journey as a participant seeking to heal herself spiritually and perhaps physically. Please join me as I engage in a conversation with these three remarkable people and find out about their life journey, how they came in each other's lives, and the work that they are currently doing to help support cancer patients. Welcome, everyone. Well, hello, everyone. Alistair, Sue, and Gina, thank you so much for agreeing to be my guests on this podcast today and start a conversation on the work that you all do, how you became drawn towards it, what was the impetus, the force, the motivation, the reason behind the work that you do, and how it has benefited yourself, of course, and others. Alistair, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I came to Canada with my wife and children in tow um, at age 37. That was in 1977. And I was hired as an immunologist, kind of cell biologist uh, at the Ontario Cancer Institute. And uh, um, now it gets tricky because within a few years, <laughs> I found I'd moved from being a laboratory, respectable laboratory scientist to being a wannabe psychologist. <laughs> and uh, Amazingly, my superiors allowed me to make this transition. Mm -hmm. The main reason was really a, a sense of 
you know, it was a midlife time. It was a sense of wanting to do something that I knew could be helpful. Mm-hmm. And I had just gotten in touch with a Swami Radha and Ashram and BC and gotten very intrigued by the idea that we could understand ourselves, which, by the way, nobody taught me when I was a kid. Did they teach, did they teach anybody else that? I don't know why. But you, can grow, you can grow to middle age without knowing that it's possible to understand yourself. Well, I got mm-hmm. And that was the hook. Mm-hmm. That was the hook for you. Yeah. Yeah, I could mm-hmm. see, you know, this is something that is going to be really helpful to people in crisis like cancer. Mm-hmm. interwoven with that was a lot of spiritual teaching that, that I got from the ashram I was going back and forwards to so I just sort of started gathered together a few patients uh, at first at home and then around 1980 at the hospital looking back you know I didn't ask permission I didn't go to a to a board of governors or I just started yeah. and amazingly um, I was allowed to. That really says a lot, I think, for the institution. that they, they had a psychiatrist there. He kept an eye on me. He was a good fellow, and he didn't interfere. And, uh, and so it started, and, and I, I did some more training, this time in psychology, and uh, sort of as a sabbatical, and started running groups and doing research. You know, I was still employed as a researcher, and I was still getting paid as a researcher, fortunately. And... And the work was mainly, at first was mainly about does this, if we run a group program, which we started off doing a group program, teaching people basic coping skills, uh, relaxation, meditation, looking within a little bit of what am I thinking? Can I manage my mind a bit better? You know, basic stuff that we do in psychology. Uh, will that help them feel better? Surprise, mm-hmm. surprise. Of course it did. <laughs> and self-report questionnaires, all the standard stuff. Of psychology. Um, that was the beginning of it. And we called it Cancer Coping Skills and we changed the name to something a little more appealing, the healing journey, um, a few years into the process. Mm-hmm. So that was the beginning. It gradually grew from there as I came to know more, I guess, and uh, get more experience with what was helpful, what wasn't. Still always working with groups for the mutual support that people could give one another. But the aim always was not just support, but the aim was to teach people ways of helping themselves. <clears throat> mm-hmm. right. That seemed to me like an important principle that I learned from my spiritual teachers that you, you can take responsibility for your own life, your own experience. And that's not such a common um, point of view, is it, in our culture? It's kind of lost somehow <laughs> in the age of cell phones. But anyway, teaching the basics of that, um, moving on, the one level after another was added. We, we had a, people writing a life story at one stage, relating it to a group. It was also a lot of fun. We had people looking more deeply into their motivations, their projections, their uh, tendency, the tendency we all have to judge and how helpful is that? And could you, how could you stop doing that if you wanted to? You know, basic mm-hmm. stuff. And, and then my, my underneath all of that psychological stuff, my interest as a former biologist become psychologist was, could this kind of work help people live longer? Tell me about Alistair. What's happening with Alistair during this time? And what is your journey? Because there is an inner journey that is, of course, connected to the outer journey and what we do, how, how we help others. Tell me a little bit, connect the, the pieces there for me, if you may. What was going on in myself was... Uh, uh, I read that part of the revelation of learning you could understand yourself. This is my late 30s, right? Nobody's ever taught me that. I discover that. I get excited. And then I look and I realize, why are you so keen on your research? Why are you working so hard? It's not really to help humanity. <laughs> it's to get famous and to do well and to be recorded, accorded respect by peers, you know. Not that there's anything particularly wrong with that, but the emphasis was a little different than I might have thought a few years earlier. Um, I wasn't trying to save the world. I was just trying to have, have a good time and, and get it elevated in people's esteem. And, you know, once you see that really clearly, you can't, you can't with a good conscience, carry on. You've got to, you've got to adjust a little bit. And, uh, and, and I suppose, you know, there was complex. There were a number of things happening, but I think that was the main one. And so I embarked on this 
you know, can I help other people? Yeah. Can I learn more about myself in the process? That was pretty interesting. Oh, so, Sue, welcome. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your life journey. So it's happening to you from the time you get your training in social work, from what I understand. And how does your life journey takes you and brings you to intersect Alistair's and then for the two of you to do the type of work that you're doing? I've always been drawn to medicine and medical related work. And so when I moved to Toronto, I ended up doing medical social work um, at a number of hospitals, ending with working on the trauma team, crisis team, sexual assault team, palliative care team at, a, at Sunnybrook Hospital. And then um, had kids and then got into teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's a whole long story that I'm sure would be pretty boring. So Right, you, you taught at Humber College for numerous yeah, years. So yeah, yeah. College for about 20, six years mm -hmm. and during that time um, I taught in a number of programs all social work counseling crisis related mm -hmm. um, my husband was diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. and so we went through a um, couple of years of the roller coaster mm -hmm. and when he started to get better he ended up connecting with Wellspring and the healing journey program Mm -hmm. And so he started doing the different levels. And one day I was picking him up. He was in level six with Alistair and he introduced us. And I met Alistair who will never acknowledge he's an extraordinary person. And he invited me to join them, which I did. And then about a year later, he asked if I would run a small group within his program. And I said, absolutely. And then a couple of years after that, he suggested that I could do the psychology part of healing journey and he would do the spiritual part. And so I said, absolutely, because I adore teaching and I love the material. And it's very meaningful to give, give people some ideas about how they can know themselves and how much richer that can make their lives in any capacity, whether they heal, whether they don't, uh, whether they're sick or not. It, to me, it's the core of everything. So that's how I ended up connecting to Alistair and I am incredibly grateful that I have. I've learned tons, um, not just from students, but a lot from Alistair from a spiritual point of view, which I've never had before. So while I'm giving, which I do and I'm happy to do, I'm also getting, and it's been a phenomenal piece, especially being a retired professor. Yeah, to, to give is to get, isn't it? Always. Yeah, we get what we put out there. And it's such a realization, it's such a wake up call. And this is pretty much what Alistair was, was touching upon, I think a little earlier when I've asked him the question as to, you know, what, what happened within him? What was the switch? There's always a switch within. Yes. Mm -hmm. that motivates those that do the type of work that you're doing mm -hmm. where they realize that mm -hmm. other people's interest is actually their own mm -hmm. and we're merely mirroring each other isn't it yes and what mm -hmm. Alistair said before is quite true that you know if somebody made me king of the world I would make this stuff be part of kindergarten mm -hmm. because so many people from teenagers through people in their 70s really have never touched this kind of material before and are absolutely most of them astonished happily to begin to look at that mirror and as Alistair start started with open the curtains yeah yeah just this there's a lot out there to look at mm -hmm. and within yourself and so you get to make choices yeah, yeah. Freedom. yeah. Mm. And in a second, I'm going to want to ask you this question about the authentic self, because I really don't believe that we can ever be able to do any teaching work unless we come prepared to put ourselves up there. And, and it takes vulnerability to do that. And not only that, but then taking all of that and laying it out there. 
for other people to look at, to maybe understand, to maybe say, oh yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I feel like that and I can't admit it or I can't say it. And yeah. now as you've yeah. said it, I can hear it, I can say it, I can ditch some of the judgment, which Alistair mm-hmm. referred to before. And then it's a whole new opening. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's incredible what happens when you shed light mm-hmm. on the boogeyman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, the, the boogeyness disappears, isn't it? Yeah. Gina. <laughs> Gina, my goodness, a, a former statistician. Now, how in the world do you come to meet those two, Sue and Alistair? Tell us about your life journey and how it took you to meet those two and then, and then so do the say, healing journey. One, once a statistician, always a statistician. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but uh, so I worked for many years in the same institution as, uh, as Alistair at the Ontario Cancer Institute and uh, was involved in helping him put the numbers behind his studies to to write the papers to show the efficacy of his program etc so so that you know i knew alistair back when he had red curly hair <laughs> um, you know, that one, was it? say that again back when you had luscious red hair right your oh. wavy red hair oh, i'm glad i didn't miss that yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's what you thought, was it? <laughs> okay, carry on. No, you don't see red hair that commonly, so yeah, it was no okay. Um, Yeah, so then, you know, many years later, I, I, as many have, became a cancer patient, and um, it wasn't, an, I, I had a, uh, an early stage cancer, and then I had a more, more, aggressive cancer, which then had a recurrence. And it wasn't really until the recurrence um, that I got a very strong message from the universe that it was time to reconnect with Healing Journey, um, which the the message came in in the uh, form of bumping into Claire Edmonds, who I had worked with. She was uh, Alistair's research assistant, and she is still a Uh, instructor with the healing journey so it was like a light bulb going off that it was time for me to um, you know do some of this work myself and then through Claire obviously we connected with Alistair Um, so my motivation you know when I was initially diagnosed with the second cancer I was tackling it in all the kind of conventional ways I was doing exercise programs and watching my diet you know obviously taking the treatments and whatever and I had done some meditation, so it wasn't I was ignoring it completely, but but then it became quite clear that that I needed to do something more. So my uh, initial impetus to rejoin the healing journey was was the spiritual search. Um, mm. he, you know what what Alistair was essentially saying about finding out who I am, trying to find the context of what it's all about, etc. So when I when I joined uh, Healing Journey, I, I got to jump to level two. I didn't have to do level one <laughs> because I had an inside inside knowledge of the people to to uh, hurry me along. But but what I really was there for was to get to the the spiritual levels because that that's what I was seeking. Um, mm-hmm. So I, you you said something really interesting that that caught my attention. It's very interesting to me that after twenty years of research and practice a cardiologist not sure if you heard of him dr dean ornish Mm -hmm. wrote his book on love and survival and he said that no other factors in medicine no diet smoking exercise stress genetics drugs not even surgery affect your health quality and the length of your life more than feeling connected loved and cared for by others feeling that you're part of a community uh, that thinks and feels the way you do so a sense of belonging to this group mm. and surprisingly this group? Arnish, right that's it's quite something yeah. for him to, to be saying that at the close yeah. of his career yeah 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 so i'm hearing levels and i'm hearing you know talk about this healing journey i want to know yeah. what is the healing journey well it's uh, it's 
structured in a series of progressive levels. And currently mm -hmm. there are six. Um, and each, it tends to be about eight weeks long, thereabouts. And, and part of the reason for that was to give people a, an opportunity to see how helpful it was for them and drop out without, you know, failing. They could drop out with dignity at any at any point. And, and that happens, of course, people for every hundred that start, maybe 10 or 20 may get to the, to the top as it were. But the levels get progressively a little more um, in depth looking. So level three, as I mentioned before, really start looking at the, how our mind works. And, uh, we, we tackle things like projection that are a little bit more complicated to understand. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the early earliest levels, we're, we're looking at stress management and coping. And the spiritual teachings, I always felt had to be introduced gradually, you know? No, we don't hit them with that. Right at the beginning, a lot of people don't want that anyway. Um, and we gradually introduce it, starting in, in by level three, we're, we're already, by the way, drawing a lot on the, A Course in Miracles, you, you'll be glad to know, because at, at the mm -hmm. time I wrote that, like 25 years ago, whenever, I was heavily into The Course in Miracles, so yeah. a lot yeah. of that found its way in mm -hmm. just the quotes and things, ideas from The Course in Miracles. But yeah. Yeah, no, the basic material, the first couple of levels are... We, 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 draw, we do a lot of experiential work, you know, teaching people to relaxation techniques mm -hmm. you know, and run, going through it with them in the class and then um, suggesting they try to practice at home with the aid of a tape or something. Mm -hmm. Again, standard standard um, stress relaxation work. Mm -hmm. By level four, we're, we're uh, trying to help people develop some qualities that Gina and I in our research on longevity of people and doing this kind of work found was important. We found that people need to be authentic, need to be um, autonomous and accepting. Mm -hmm. Triple A's, mm -hmm. right? Easy yes. Right. And so level four was mainly about how do you do, how do I develop these qualities? Authentic <laughs> meaning, having the right to do what I think is important in my life. Autonomy, feeling I'm empowered to do it. Accepting meaning the more spiritual quality of not resisting everything, but going along with the body and its problems. <laughs> not working on it, but 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 not not um, not objecting to everything you see in the world around you, which is yeah. you know, a basic spiritual thing. That's level four. Level five, maybe people mainly study um, Eckhart Tolle. Uh, I wrote a course on the Course in Miracles. I gave it myself. I probably need your help, Gabriella, because I tried for ten years to teach a Course in Miracles, and um, I'm not sure that many people really got off on it. You know, yeah. one or two do. Because they find it hard to read. That was the original level five, but it got supplanted by Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, which is much easier to read and everyone can enjoy it and understand it without too much trouble. So that's the fun. Level six, this is where Sue and I come in now. We, we're both retired persons having fun, volunteering our time and teaching the psychological work, Sue, and the spiritual work, me, to people who've got this far and who are keen. And boy, what a privilege that is, you know, isn't it, Sue, to teach people who yeah. really want to learn are there because they want to be, not because they're being impelled by fear of cancer. And, and in fact, we don't talk that much about cancer, at least like that. Yeah. We, talk about, we talk about finding out who you are, mm -hmm. basically, psychologically and then spiritually. And, and, and Gina's been a veteran of that program now for a couple of years, and, and she is currently, she helps me in some of my groups, with the spiritual groups with the logistics and chips in from time to time. <laughs> so so six, is, six is just really, it's a more, more in-depth work on the psychology and spirituality that was introduced earlier. And then we have, when, for, for graduates who want to do more, we have a stream, both Sue and I have a stream of work called uh, Continuing Your Healing Journey, where we read things and study things that take our fancy. That are helpful and we have various discussion groups where we read books together we read the seth books uh, we read a lot of non-dual authors these days um, so there's a lot of groups going on basically mm. this is fascinating to me and for our listeners you know it takes a lot of work to put together a curriculum that is psychological in nature that takes one perhaps that hasn't done much inquiry into the question of who is the me living in the world Mm -hmm. and and start making one aware of the idea of projection and perception the idea of core beliefs that tend to be uh 
cemented when we're very young, when the egoic uh, state starts developing. I'm not worthy. I can't say no. I mm -hmm. um, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't ask for what I need and what I want and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and then one goes through life um, and then start experiencing this consistent negative affect and, and get stuck. And that's when people usually tend to come to groups such as the one that you developed, especially uh, on a cancer journey. And for you to take them step by step through those processes, this is much more than counseling one on one. This is group counseling. And it's, it's very, mm -hmm. very difficult because you have group dynamics and you have individual dynamics. Um, so I, I have such respect for you and appreciation. I can't even fathom the amount of work that it must have taken for you to develop this program for people. And I, I, I would assume that they are fascinated by it because once you open the door to self-inquiry mm. and you quiet those uh, meanings that you've given things and judgments, my goodness, what comes out is something quite beautiful and, and, and like a child you become curious hopefully you want to know some more. people shut that door again pretty quick <laughs> that's absolutely yeah that can be terrifying what we see can be mm. terrifying well, susan, I, I'm, susan? I'm still terrified at, at my willingness to give my peace away <laughs> sue's a master at, at group process i mean much more so than i am you, you, you should talk to that uh, so let's talk to, uh, to sue group. about this some more yes i'm always mm, tweaking if you will, the material. Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking, okay, so I've done this several times. This really worked. This didn't work so much. This kind of fell flat. How can I shift it? Is it really important or do I need to bring something else in? And I'm always looking for new examples, new readings, uh, YouTubes, whatever, to highlight. Oh, beautiful. Because you want to talk to people in ways they can accept and understand. And sometimes that communication has to occur through a video or through a poem yeah. or through beautiful, absolutely wonderful. In terms of group dynamics, I can't say we don't do supporting in the group because that is mm. an integral, it's almost automatic. It's almost a given. But the focus is more in education. It's more mm. on learning how, who am I? How do I figure it out? What choices do I wanna make once I know? And then how do I set goals and plan and create, not find, but create my life? Mm -hmm. So group dynamics fit into it in that, like all groups or most groups, people kind of become a bit more cohesive. And in that process, they begin to feel that they belong, as you were talking about before. They're not alone. Oh, other people feel this way. Other people feel that if I lie down in the afternoon with a book, I'm being unproductive and lazy. And then we can work, and this is where the support comes in, along with the education is, well, how do you reframe that? How do you take that belief, really look at it, not shut the door on it, accept that you feel it, and then change it, if you mm -hmm. want to, right? Because it's a choice. The other thing I do in my classes um, is I break everybody into small groups at some point during the two hours. And I have to say, Gina didn't mention this, but Gina has been a small group leader for me a number of times. And I can't teach what I teach and the way I teach without people like that to also mm -hmm. work small groups with me. Mm -hmm. the you developed a community of people like Gina and others that have gone through those groups and those mm -hmm. levels that understand the material, that are excited about the material. And now that they've learned it, they want to share it with others. What a brilliant way to make a program like this sustainable. Well, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And not, you know, me, the teacher, and they're my little group. I mean, it's a, it's a team across the board. Mm -hmm. And those small groups is where the quiet people have a chance to be more comfortable and to be more vulnerable. 
as Brene Brown would say, and put stuff out there and really get heard in a way that they don't feel they can in a big group. Mm -hmm. Then we come back, we debrief because we want to, one person will sort of outline. And then sometimes I'll do a quick summary that I'll email out to everybody because sometimes stuff moves quickly and people want to hold on longer. And then we sort of, um, I'm not great at leading a meditation, but I can do a deep breathing. <laughs> so <laughs> I do deep breathing as a way to kind of end. And I've developed a workbook that gets emailed to everybody and they have homework. That's the other mm -hmm. thing we do. Mm -hmm. the so there is, there is an accountability component, but I, which I think also is very important. There should, yeah. For learning to be sustained. Yeah, I mean, nobody gets obviously marked. And if they don't do the homework, I want them to come anyway. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. idea is that if you do the homework, you're going to get this a lot more, a lot more deeply. And that's what the small groups are based on. Mm, which is lovely, because in this fashion, you customize it, you let everybody go as deep as they want to go and as far as they want to go. And that's up to them. Yeah. Those that are ready, they have the material and they can do it and they can move from one level to another. And those that are going slow, because, you know, we're all different people and we all have our own path. It all leads to the same place. But uh, and, and fascinating how you all grow and how you all learn together. So this is definitely a program that is about education. Mm -hmm. But it also empowers everybody and it keeps mm -hmm. practicing. It keeps exercising the same skills over and over again and perhaps going deeper with some of them for those that are interested. What I think is really core along with what you've said mm -hmm. is the support to look at the painful, difficult stuff mm -hmm. to not push it away, to not sit on it, to not bury it, to look at it and to believe that it can shift. Mm -hmm. right and then when you can do that there's an opening for every all the spiritual pieces that people can oh, open up to I don't you know mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I think what I do and what Alistair does just dovetails beautifully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you complement each other very well don't you so how long have you been working with each other now how many years uh, three, four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Wow. Something wow. Like that. Yeah. Mm, wonderful. Gina, let me ask you a question. So tell me a little bit about your process going through the healing journey program that Alistair put together. What happened to you? What was the hook for you? And what, what kept you going? Because you're still going at it. Yeah. So so the initial hook, as I say, was was the the spiritual searching, uh, which I think was underpinned by fear. Right, your 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 life is in threat, and you're fearful. And I wanted I wanted to put that in context and and not be fearful. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the beauty of the levels and. When I when I researched with Alistair, there was only three levels. So when I came back to it, found out there were six. It was like it was exploding. But I think the 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 levels bring you slowly. So you're not you're not hit right away with something that's too big for your your mind to understand. So what I found for myself was, you know, maybe in the initial days I was like, well, I don't really understand projection. I don't really think I project. And then, you know, gradually you're like, mm, okay, I'm starting to see. So, it, so it's, it's kind of like an unveiling or an unfolding that, you know, each time I, I, I revisit, you know, I see a little bit more insight. Um, and certainly I've been exposed to spiritual authors that I had never heard of. Um, and that's allowing me to, one, see different perspectives on spirituality, but, but I think um more importantly to see how they all dovetail yeah yeah so, yeah. so, so that mm. they, they they seem to be giving the same message which um perhaps for us you know a person of a more scientific mind is is actually very reassuring so i think for me 
um, it grabs my intellect. There's a lot of stuff to think and feel about. Um, it, it, it grabs me in the sense that I do feel changes in myself. Um, I do think it has offered me ways to, you know, through the, the um, meditations and imagery and uh, contacting the inner healer work, et cetera, that Alistair leads us through, it's allowed me to tap more into my either, you could say either deeper or higher uh, wisdom or voice or whatever. Um, and then there is also a bit of an aspect, you, you know, with just, I help out in the background on Zoom calls and I do a little bit of work with Sue. Again, there's that a little bit of that helping out where I can kind of feeling, right? It's, it's a little, it's a little bit of a- yeah, You're giving back in quite a big way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At some level, so. I hear you shed light on a process that is a hook for many of us. And that is, you know, here we go about doing our lives and doing our own thinking. And then somebody comes along and they say, well, there's another way to look at this. And you say, yeah, what is it? And they tell yeah, you about it. it. <laughs> uh-huh, what is it? And then they tell you about it and you, you start exercising that process, that practice. And, and you know what Albert Einstein said, you know, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. We all know it's not working. But suddenly somebody comes along and they say, well, there's another way to look at this. This is a process. Try it. You try it. And you're beginning to see results. And that's when you, the things start turning. <laughs> and they may not, for some may not turn right away. Some may still be in denial, but eventually everybody gets to that point where they look at their lives and the way they've conducted the, the, their own process, self-developed <laughs> and self-nurtured. And they're saying, oh, things are, they could be better. It could be better. And then yeah. somebody comes along and poof, all of a sudden, you know, we're starting to think differently. And if I, if I think differently about this, if I change my mind, would 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 how I feel change, and when when you start seeing the results of that, then you're much more tempted to to continue with the work and take a deeper look and understand yeah. really the power that lies within your own mind. Mind is a very powerful thing, and for you, all three of you, bless you, Alistair, to really develop something that helps people initiate this process. I think it's outstanding. Such a gift. Yeah, it feels it feels much much less like a curriculum and more like yeah. uh, tools for your self discovery. Mm -hmm. And that once you have those tools, you can continue to discover and and grow and whatever. You don't necessarily have to have you know the healing journey once a week kind of thing. You you, I mean, it does help to keep you on track. You no, know, you know mm -hmm. for sure. But but you have the tools to. To work on yourself and continue your discovery mm -hmm. and i think that's probably one of the most valuable things because yeah you know we, we we can't continue to teach everybody you have to graduate them off to look mm -hmm. after themselves mm -hmm. I think so we're all, we're all happy that uh you know this helps some people and and it adds up to quite a lot of people over the years but i I'm also, I, I remain unhappy at the, at the fact that there are many people who just can't reach. Through and, and I think what's... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry Alistair. I think what yeah. Sue said, it has to be introduced so much earlier as a concept of, mm. of something that, you know, that, that, that's possible, right? It, it, it's like we don't find out about it until we've got some sort of crisis, right? And that's the shame of it. You have to have a crisis to bring you to the point that you're so needing to look for something. So it needs to be way back talked about in public school or whatever to make help. people aware, you know. It's a cultural this, shift then maybe. Yeah, unfortunately, I think so. And it, mm. it's, it's pretty hard for one man to shift a culture. You can shift a little part of the culture. <laughs> or even three or four of us <laughs> yeah well that was you know that was partly my thinking in the early days that uh, naive if we could get good evidence that this would prolong life and we do you know and i and the other investigators involved we got some evidence but not enough to not enough to persuade the, the skeptical no one near it's it's difficult technically but mm -hmm. 
I at least convinced myself and I see, have seen it clinically, people do tend to live longer, not everybody, but if they get really involved in this work. And my hope was at that time that if you could demonstrate this clearly enough, then it would become something that was advocated by the, by the oncologist, by everybody, and would become part of the protocol. And, you know, even the people who are relatively reluctant to look within might be persuaded to do some work along those lines because of the great reward that was being promised. Now, that doesn't jive with my current spiritual view of the universe, which is much more closer to what you, you laid out. Like when people are ready, they'll come and don't be ambitious for others. You know, I agree with all that. But I would still like knowing, as you've pointed out, the great power of the mind to influence reality, really, influence ourselves, certainly our bodies. Can we harness that? so that people don't have to suffer these horrible diseases, <laughs> premature death. I think, the, I think the potential is there, lurking in the background, but I don't know how to access it for more than just a few brave souls, Gina, a few like her, who are able to get it together enough and are open-minded enough, interested enough and smart enough to get on, to get on with it themselves, you know and make a big difference to their own life. Talking about uh, A Course in Miracles. So, <laughs> so everybody, this is how Alistair and my pathway intersected first time in 2007. I'm a professor at University of Toronto, and I invite Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, who um, was close to the scribers of A Course in Miracles, to give a talk at University of Toronto, and Alistair shows up. And then the two of us, at the, uh, during the break, I guess we get to talk, and I find out that he works with cancer patients, and he finds out that I, I teach an insane number of courses at University of Toronto, and that oftentimes I, I bring up some of the principles of A Course in Miracles, and he invites me over to uh, his house where him and Mrs. Cunningham are there and they're offering me tea and we start talking about the work that he's doing and I find out that he put a, a, an insane amount of work in even a manual that gives people affected by cancer and ideas to you know what are some of the the principles of a course in miracles he even created multiple choice questions and then he says oh, you should help me take a look at those multiple because you're a professor and I'm a professor let's let's have a look at those multiple choice questions how can we tweak it up right right Alistair so tell me a little bit. So you become, tell me, when did the course come in your life and what in the world propelled you <laughs> to put a manual together and, and weave it a little bit in the very fabric of, of the healing journey? Well, I, my own cancer it was um, 87, 88. And uh, so I went off to an ashram to, mm -hmm. to get help. And uh, the, for, at the end of 1987, I believe it was, when I came back, Someone had dropped this big blue book on my desk. <laughs> what happens, a nut! What a nut! Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> hey, coincidence, of course. <laughs> yeah. And I got into it and I was fascinated. You know, the Course in Miracles. Of course, in Miracles. And I don't need to tell you just how wonderful it is. It's a magisterial, sort of remarkable channeled document. And I, I studied it for years. I still do dip into it. I, I love it. And, and perhaps for 20 years, it was my main squeeze, as it were. I would carry around little things in my pocket and, and remember the lessons every day. I went through all the lessons three times. And I got a lot out of it, no question. But as out of that enthusiasm, I, it was natural for me to want to try to teach it to others too, or to, to introduce yeah. it at least to others. And I did try for 10 years. And we had about 300 people in total do a course using my, the manual you mentioned. And I think maybe partly I may, I may have made it, I don't know, I may, not, I may not have done a good job in simplifying it enough, let's say, that people could really take to it. But it is a, a difficult read, isn't it? I mean, it is a very difficult read, yes. Some folks get sure. onto it, but, but most perhaps don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's remarkable what you've done with it. Where does this want to share? one's journey, one's process. Here you are, you, you read a, about a document, you interact with it, something happens within you and you want to share it. You want to you wanna give it to others. You, mm -hmm. you hope that maybe they will have the same experience with you. And I think the sentiment behind the question that you had for me earlier, you know, how do we get more people access to this program mm -hmm. and, and to Wellspring that offers such beauty of of programs such as this, how do we give them access? I think it has something to do with your um, willingness to be vulnerable, to be authentic. 
It, it, I, I think it's such an important element, this authenticity. Look, I work with this material. This is what's happening to me. I think it's important. And I think it's so important that I want to share it with you. Why would I keep it for myself? If it's that good, if it makes mm. me feel that good and brings me such peace of mind, why not share it with others? Which leads me to my next question. I know many people are going to listen to this podcast and they will be curious as to how could they join the healing journey and who, what we know, what is Wellspring and do I need to have a membership with Wellspring? How do I get on the healing journey? Is it as simple as contacting an email or uh, calling a phone number? How, how can one be part of the healing journey? Um, I suppose I should answer that. I mean, I mean, I think just on the internet, wellspring.ca, or there's another there's another avenue called Well on the Web. Well on the Web. If they look that up, they'll find directions to the various programs. And there are 40 or 50 programs and Wellspring offers a whole range of things. And Healing Journey is one of them. And you can find your way to it and register online or the telephone numbers you can call up. And, and have a volunteer register. And if, you, if someone was wanting to join the healing journey, they would want to start, I think, on at level one, sign up for that. And there, there are a number of teachers teaching the various lower levels and, and then work their way up. If they find that it suits them, work their way up through the levels. Eventually yeah. they may reach Sue and me and Gina <laughs> sitting there up on the top, so to speak. Are you teaching all levels or are you dividing the levels between yourselves? How, how do you do this? No, no, no. We're just, we just now teaching level six mm -hmm. and the subsequent discussion groups gotcha. that, that follow on after it. And wow. we're a, quite a crew of, of teachers. Wellspring yeah. has very kindly taken over the program as well. Oh, of its beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Right. Since we left, uh, the, so yeah. retired been like 17 years ago from the healing, from the uh, Ontario Cancer Institute, where we used to run it all. And Wellspring took it over and they run it and do a good job. And they hire therapists to run the various levels. And they- It's incredible. Do, yeah. That's incredible, isn't it? Well, I'm not surprised because you put a lot of work in developing a curriculum, an actual, you know, written materials and exercises and, and everything is just so well yeah. coordinated. There, there are actual curriculums for each level. That's outstanding, Alistair. That is really outstanding. I'm not surprised that you've been recognized with the Rogers Prize and some other awards throughout your lifetime. You've done a, an incredible amount of work well, for the it was cancer. A long time, you know, it would happen over a long period, Gabriella. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've but dedicated say... your life to this. Yes, Gina. It's almost like he can't help himself. I was just thinking about with this, with the spiritual level six, I think I've maybe been in it two or three times now. And mm -hmm. every time the, the manual's just tweaked a bit and, and there's just, you know, I, I thought mm -hmm. about how I said this and I want to tackle it a bit differently, or I want to reorder things a little bit. So, so he's always continual, process improvement or program improvement um, and you said you said at first he can't help himself do you feel that <laughs> i'm interested i think that there i think your your inner spiritual whatever is still working at it and still molding yeah. this whole process and and it's You're his process sharing. really it's his process that is being given out to others yeah. isn't it I think, he's sharing I his think, own process yeah i think it's your spiritual purpose you know, you know i don't think it's coming from you it's very interesting to hear someone else say that i thought it might sound a bit pretentious if I said, <laughs> but that, that, that really is it how have. it is mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's coming i think most of this program has come through me rather than from me basically i, just, I had no trouble writing the books the three books uh, published oh. on and, and that sort of came through you know i mean i supplied some of the the work and some of the some of the grunt work, I suppose, but the, most of it came through. And, and that's what I feel now these days. I would just like people, I hope this doesn't sound unprofessional, I would just like people to have the same attitude towards the world that I have, you know. Mm -hmm. Just it's all very wonderful. And, and try to communicate yeah. a little bit of that to them using, um, using the various techniques of, you know, of, of reading and discussing and doing experiential exercises and and, and seeing what other people have said. 
But yeah. it's really, and that's, it dovetails, I think, with what you said earlier yeah. about being vulnerable or being yourself, yeah. I prefer to yeah. say. Yeah. And yourself has got all kinds of flaws, but if you're enthusiastic and you really feel it, I think we respond to that as human beings, don't we? Yeah, so I wanted to say two things. One is, one of the things that Alistair does beautifully in the spiritual piece to, I'm also a student for his spiritual continuing healing journey. Um, and I came with no spiritual connection, if you will. Uh -huh. He essentially says, don't do what I say or just do what I'm telling you. Really look at it, feel it out, sit with it, see what resonates and what doesn't. So there's no, for lack of a better word, there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. It's not fitting you into a little cubby, a little square box. It's, you know, and that is coming from Alistair. And yeah, it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. Then there is a difference. Yeah. The I don't think as much, it's not very remarkable, Sue. I mean, oh, you do the same at the psychological level. Not remarkable? No, it's not. I mean, I, yeah, it's not, you don't tell people what to do in the psychological work. I think where it becomes I mean, remarkable, Alistair, is within the spiritual realm. Thank you. Yes. It's quite often much more. Well, well, I, but I that's because that's we same. all suffer from the legacy of dogmatic uh, religion. Yeah, mm. I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that you don't do that no. really no. welcomes people in a very unique way. Yeah, of course. And yeah. it's scarier because you don't have the prescribed list of rules. But it's also, uh, to use your word from before, Gabriella, it's very empowering. Yeah. To yeah. then say, wow, there's yeah. this whole smorgasbord of ideas. Yeah. What do I want to pick? What do I want to taste? What do I want to try on? What mm -hmm. feels good? What doesn't? And mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. exciting. And that was the other piece I wanted to mention before when you were talking about this drive to get all of our beliefs, ideas, excitement, etc., out there, is it's also about this excitement around connecting. Because when, when we teach and we put an idea out there, you watch people kind of light up in different ways. And then the discussion starts and then the questions come. And then the, oh, I never thought of that or, oh, that's interesting, or I don't know how to do that. How do I do that? And so it becomes this whole new world, if you will. And that is incredibly exciting, but really connective. Mm. Yes. We are dealing with, uh, with an epidemic of disconnect and loneliness. <laughs> we, we, mm. we want to connect so badly, just don't know how to do it. And to... Um, you know, to dedicate one's life to opening a conversation about our mind, the role that the mind plays in how we feel, this alignment between the mind and the heart, and this process and this journey that we can all undertake that, you know, something good can come out of it, if you give it a try. And the beautiful part too, is that, yeah. Not only do we become lonely because we don't connect with others, but so many people don't connect with themselves mm -hmm. and they don't see that they have that relationship with themselves. And so everything else just kind of gets, mm -hmm. I don't know, either pushed away or just sort of dragged along without any real thought mm -hmm. or awareness. Yeah, that's very good, isn't it? I mean, you've, you've got to connect with yourself, as you say. You've got to know yourself ultimately love yourself before you can apply the same to anybody else how could yeah that's and, fundamental and, and, yeah it's fundamental and we don't teach it to kids it's too bad I mean, it's definitely we don't in institutions most people's spiritual main spiritual teacher is suffering in other yeah. words it's an incentive to start to look as you as you point out but even with that my my experience is the great majority of people don't use it that way and that come, takes me back to my original, you know, my earlier point about how do we reach people who, who don't naturally gravitate into this kind of self-investigation? 
I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't found out. Where do you see yourselves a couple of years down the road in terms of your program? And what would you what what would the ideal situation look like in terms of your program and your outreach? What would that look like? Well, one of the things that occurs to me um, is, you know, Wellspring talked about opening up to live in in house classes uh, this January, which, of course, isn't happening because of Omicron. And I was thinking a lot about that. And, you know, in my classes, my two classes, I have people from Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, all over Ontario, all the Mm -hmm. way out to Halifax. Mm -hmm. I have people who live nearby but are too sick to actually come in, Mm -hmm. but are good to lie in bed and listen and maybe contribute, maybe not. I don't want to lose that. So in some ways, ironically, I don't see ever not doing Zoom in the next three, four years. I I have to continually remind myself that most of the students I have that I feel so connected with, I've never actually met face to face. Mm -hmm. And I forget that. So that's one of the pieces I would like to continue with over the next four or five years. I was thinking more in terms of the uh, what's going on inside rather than the logistics. And <laughs> I'm, I'm getting on in, in years. I, 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 I want to stay alive and, and well, you know, and, and, and vigorous enough to keep doing it. Uh, um, but I think if I'm really honest, uh, what's going to happen if I'm still teaching and people are still coming is I'm going to be drifting more and more into my interest, which is really the non-duality, the, non- the non-dual spirituality. And, and the, the root of that is trying to learn not to see oneself as separate anymore, not, not as a separate, you know, to, it's not, put it another way, to, to remove the focus from being an individual you can stay an individual, but to remove that the focus of all one's ambition and attention around that, it's so damaging. It's damaging to oneself, yeah. damaging to other people, it's damaging to the world. And just learn what these masters teach us that, and the great mystics have always said, look, you're, 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 you're part of one consciousness. If you want to use religious language, you're an idea in the mind of God. Yeah. I don't particularly talk in those ways to, the, to my students. Most of the time, but that's that's more or less what it is. And once that, once we sort that out, once I can sort it and get it real clear in my own mind and my own heart, then I can convey it to other people. I hope my hope is yeah. to teach it better than I do, to really know it myself. And once one, once that problem is solved, who am I? All other problems disappear. <laughs> I mean, there's no beginnings or endings anymore. For example. So there's no death. I mean, the body's going to die. The spirit or the consciousness is not going to die. I mean, what better present could you give to someone with a life-threatening cancer than to help them see that even if they die, it's not the end of them? That's the greatest healing, I think. Well, I'm not sure uh, it differs that much from what you said, Alistair. Um, probably less emphasis on the teaching, mind you, but but as I said, I feel like I'm exposing myself to the different teachers and gradually increasing my understanding. And, and I, I see that as something that could easily take up years, right? That, yeah. it's, that it's, it's really a continuing process. Um, you could teach most of what I do now but, but where you might have difficulty would be a reluctance to, <clears throat> to be vulnerable, you know, in the way that Gabrielle is saying. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah. How can, yeah, how can that happen? Sure. How, could that, how could that happen? How could you feel that you were willing to take that risk? I have to take <laughs> Sue's course a few more times to yeah. start unpacking all the psychological stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Maybe that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> Not fair to pop it at you now. He knows me. 
<laughs> he knows me. I was just going to say, you know, in, in a funny way, for the next several years, I see us doing much of what we're doing now. Yeah. yeah. Continuing yeah. To, to tweak, to create into some kind of digestible form, a lot of what we're learning, a lot of our lives, a lot of what we want to exchange and connect, you know, this conduit, so to speak. Um, and interestingly, and this is something we've alluded to throughout the conversation, um, Gabriella, your word around vulnerability, to share those personal life experiences, uh, the ones where, you know, I can say to a class, you know, I'm not immune from not getting it, or I'm not, I'm not perfect at doing this either. And so it brings it home for all of us to be able to say, yeah, we can't always do this and we're working on it and it's okay. And mm -hmm. to all that horrible judgment mm -hmm. that we could necessarily bestow on a loved one, but we very easily throw at ourselves. Judgment is the culprit of uh, a lot of distress, you know, mm -hmm. um, and to understand that we're never upset for the reason we think. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. a major step in self-discovery. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if I'm not upset for the reason I think, then what is it that I'm upset about? Absolutely. And how, so, and taking the next step, I have given everything, all the meaning, that they have i see no neutral things i i have no neutral thoughts all the meaning that i see it's self-created yeah. no wonder why i can't see right and and again remembering that every just you know uh, a, a, a good friend of mine and i did a podcast with her carol uh how <laughs> she said something really funny but very true she said those son of a bitches were sent out there to save us when are we going to wake up to that <laughs> So every time you encounter a difficult situation, a difficult person, they are such great because what do they do? They trigger something within. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. I was able to actually wake up and start peeling those, those layers that I've added onto that are an impediment uh, to, to me coming to come to know myself. Well, this has been a wonderful experience talking to you and learning a little bit about what you do and uh, how you have come to know yourself through the work that you do and reach the, the lives of others. And you continue to do that. You want to do that. You want to spend the rest of your life doing that. Well, thank you, Gabriel, for yes, the opportunity. Yeah. From the, from thank the, and, you. And Thank you so much. Well, kudos to you Thank too you. for what you're doing. Yeah. And this concludes my conversation with Alistair Cunningham, Sue Davis Mandalo, and Gina Lockwood. For more information about Wellspring and the programming that they're offering, please visit their website www.wellspring.ca. Thank you all for listening. Until next time, be well and take care of yourselves. <laughs>